Hey everyone, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello there. Happy New Year. Um, let's see, it looks like Mercedes is um, saying she had to join on her phone. So I'm going to try to see if I can unmute her in this um, meeting setting that we have. I'm not sure if I can since she's on the phone, but I will do my best here. Give me one moment and we'll get started. Okay, Mercedes, let's ask you to give it a try on your phone and see if you're able to unmute yourself now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, success. It worked. Okay. Yeah. I am also on my laptop, so I'm going to turn on so at least you can all see my whole face here. Um, sorry about having to um, flip that, but my uh, my headphones aren't able to attach to my computer. Okay. Look, we have a small group with us today, um, but let's go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order and start our roll call. Um, I'm going to start with let's see just I guess a here <laughs> as a member of the meeting uh Suisa. Here. Debbie. Here. Elisa. I'm here. Thank you. Elisa. Here. Marianne. Here. And our organizer extraordinaire, Amy. Hello. Hello, here. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think our agenda for January should hopefully be fairly straightforward. Um, we will do our call to order and roll call. Um, we'll set aside some time for public comment. Um, and then I really kind of expect us to use the entirety of the meeting for the agency presentations around the payment models. Um, so Amy, I know we got at least one comment from one department was like, I don't want to go first, <laughs> but I don't know if we have um, any, like any other way of essentially or ordering the departments other than like random or alphabetical, I guess. Any any feedback there, any based on anything you've heard from the department? Um, not really that I've heard from the departments, but um, I know DAS um, did ask if they could go first. Kelly Mix will be presenting, and I think he had other um, uh, re uh, meetings that he had to jump off to, so he would love it if he could be first on the agenda. Okay. Debbie? I was... Also, I, I was unaware that Kelly had asked to go first, but I was going to suggest that DAS either go first or last, simply because their, I think their presentation is going to be different than everyone else's. Um, because at DAS, we, we don't have a lot of the citizen facing grant programs and, and things like that. So we just, and we, yeah, we don't have the client services contract. So I think ours is just going to be a little different than others. Okay. So we can at least, um, put that in for now that DAS will go first since we've had that request from them. And then, um, and since, yeah, since we're starting with Department of Administration, I wonder if it just makes sense to put things in relatively alphabetical order. So admin going first and then from there down. Unless anyone else has a better idea, I think, on how to, how to put us into order. Is it going to be a lot of like trying to keep everybody to their 15 minutes <laughs> as we move through? But yeah, any other opinions on order? I 
I think alphabetical oh. sounds good. So then we would have DELC, Department of Early Learning. Then we would have DOJ. Um, I'll then jump we would in have and share that D DOJ is not participating because they don't have, they can't speak to the questions that we're asking um, this time. They might participate in an, a later question and answer session, but they won't participate this round. That's very helpful. Thank you uh, for that update. Oh, hello, Helen. Welcome. Hi, I just had a question about DOJ because um, they might not have, well, okay, maybe another, maybe it's fine that they present later because they obviously play a, a big role in reviewing the contracts and it seems like that is a an area where there's a significant lags. So anyway, just want to make sure that we um, get information on that at some point. Absolutely agreed. And I wouldn't, so kind of moving into the next phase of, of thinking about how we're going through our agenda. So because we have so many departments, um, I think I mentioned we're, they're really only going to have about 15 minutes. We've asked each department to um, submit something in writing and then use their 15 minutes as a summary of a memo that they'll send to us. There are definitely going to be follow up questions, and I think some of the DOJ overlap is likely to come up in follow up questions. So, what we're also going to need is a way of capturing questions that we're not able to field during the presentations so that departments can respond to that. I think that's another way where we might integrate DAS, some of DAS responses. Um, because I think part of it is understanding um, to what you kind of just said, Helen, is like when it is that the departments begin to interact with DOJ compliance is really where those questions are going to come up. So I, I do kind of understand like they don't necessarily have policies on indirect rates, right? They're not establishing that. Um, so that makes sense why they're not presenting specifically, but I think we may need to have a way of capturing those follow-up questions for report back. Um, one way we could do that is um, by having people uh, put their questions in the chat, which would also mean that I would ask people to not use the chat for side conversation. So that way we're easily able to capture questions. Um, another way we could do that is maybe um, have uh, a link to a document that people can add, add questions to that might get a little bit messy. Um, but I think there's also, um, Amy, help me with this one, because one of the reasons that we were kind of playing around with the jam board was that we needed to be able to show the public what we were discussing. Like we couldn't have it in some other platform that we couldn't also present. So um, would we be able to have a document that's able to collect questions or does that need to be like visible on the screen? if we're collecting questions during the presentation? I, I think the, the issue would be is how do we capture who's asking the question if we add it to a document? Um, that's sort of where we got stuck with the Jamboard too is not everyone was adding their name to their notes and so that got a little tricky. Um, so I think the chat is probably a better feature because it will capture who it is that's asking the question. Um, unless we want, if you want me to scribe, I can scribe and try to collect all of that. It just gets a little bit hairy if people are coming and going from the waiting room and the lobby. I can't always hear because there's an announcement to me that no one else can hear on my side that says someone's waiting in the lobby and then I don't hear the conversation. Um, so I think the chat is probably our best bet. So any other thoughts? from our other agenda planning folks? I think the chat is a fine idea. Um, and then it's also in the recorded conversation. It's it's in the recording. Yeah. Okay, so when we jump into our meeting, we'll do our call to order, our public comment, then we'll have our present. So I'll probably do a little bit of an explanation at that point to remind folks like we're not going to have a lot of time for discussion in this meeting because we're going to be listening to a lot of information 
if you have follow up questions, put your follow up questions in the chat and please try to avoid using the chat for slide discussion so that we don't miss capturing any follow up questions. The departments would then be given those follow up questions to respond to um, so that we kind of have full information um, there. And so then essentially we end up with almost like a little booklet, right? We have on this topic, we've got all the department memos, we've got their PowerPoint presentations, and then we'll have a follow up document from each department who had follow up questions. And that will then be our payment models that prioritize cost recovery. <laughs> and that's what we'll be able to use to kind of start developing our recommendations for that specific one. Um, okay, just taking a look at the chat here. So we've got um, police to doubling down on the DOJ. Can we ask DOJ to provide info on where they have touch points? That's a really good uh, framing of that. So, um, Amy, I'm wondering if you can take that step. Uh, since they obviously reported back to you that they didn't have anything for this presentation, um, if you can ask them to give us some more information about where they do have interaction with any of our topics so that we know either when we're getting a standalone presentation from them or when we need to be asking for their input um, in addition if they're not, like, example here, like, what is their engagement around payment structures? Do they approve payment structures? Do they evaluate payment structures and contracts? Just to get a sense of what questions we should be asking them as we're moving through all of the presentations, really, because you can imagine this is gonna happen again where they might feel like they don't have something directly to present based on the questions that we're putting together for the different topics, but that we know they have influence over these different topics. Does that make sense? It does, and I'd be happy to do that. Um, with that, I do want to share that um, Kristen Galino is, is out on some sort of leave, and so she's been replaced by a gentleman named Jonathan Grew. Um, their attorney general has appointed Jonathan in her place. So Kristen will be back in a few months, but Jonathan is joining us this month. And then we had a second representative named Kate Dennison, and she has left the agency, so we don't have a second DOJ person. Um, so just some nuances there. I will reach out to Jonathan and see what we can learn uh, about these touch points and see um, how they'll interact with us as we move forward to the, the next um, topics. Okay, I gotta say, and now I'm getting all nervous about DOJ. Okay, um, <laughs> because I think one of my fears, and I'm sure others share it, is that we come up with recommendations and at the 11th hour, DOJ is like, oh, you can't do any of those things. Um, so I want to make sure, just because that's what we've seen happen in the contract space, right? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just being flipping a little bit. But like, so we want to make sure that we're involving them early and often so that they're really helping us understand the sandbox that we're playing in and where we have flexibility and where, I don't want to say we don't have flexibility, but where things get more complicated. And then that's kind of it for the pre for the agenda because it's just all presentations. <laughs> Go ahead, Marianne. Trying to lower my hand now, and I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, okay, there you go. All right. Um, so one of the things I've been thinking about the last couple of weeks is. Um, Cahoots is the street response in Eugene, Oregon, and there's something called Portland Street response up in Portland. Uh, uh, Cahoots is down in Eugene. It's kind of the model that the other ones are based on. King County also has one. And um, so this is the issue for me. My husband was a firefighter for 36 years. And so um, for, for a firefighter or an EMT, uh, they are part of a union. Union. But if you're in cahoots and you're a firefighter or an EMT or a peer support or a mental special, a mental health specialist, you have no union representation. So the wages are vastly different. And I think that's the same way with Lane County um, and the state of Oregon. In my response, uh, it feels like maybe um, some of these things become grants or contracts 
because uh, the state or the county is intentionally outsourcing those things that might be covered by a bargaining agreement. So um, I just found out this morning, I called Whitebird and I called Portland. So Portland just passed in July. They're now part of the Professional and Technical Employees Local 17. And uh, Cahoots is now in the process of becoming part of the Teamsters Local 206. So I think, especially when we get to that um, living wage, standard wage question, I think we need to discuss being represented by a union or not. And I and I don't know how open nonprofits are to having that discussion. Or if we just veer it towards, is there something happening that makes, um, if you're a firefighter working for Portland, then you're represented by Portland Firefighters Association. But if you're a EMT working on cahoots, you're not represented by the same union as the police and fire in Eugene, right? So those kinds mm -hmm. of questions. Sure. Um, I, I would, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all, actually, if unions came up in the discussion. Um, I've been working in nonprofit for many years. I've been in some organizations where I've been represented other organizations where I haven't been represented, I will definitely tell you the lowest paid job I had, I was represented. Um, and so I think it's not a silver bullet, but I think it's definitely well worth a discussion about how do we create wage floors? How do we create uh, empowerment among employees to negotiate with their um, employers? I also think one of the tricky things with unions and nonprofits is that it's not the same as a for-profit where you can go and just negotiate straight with the leaders of that organization, right? What we're finding here is that the decision about what's available in wages doesn't exist in the sole hands of the organization. It exists in a combination of hands of what the legislature put into a budget, what the department is willing to put into a contract, and then what the organization is able to put into their staff. So I think it's a well worth conversation. And I think on the other point of like outsourcing work, I think historically nonprofits are the place where we do what the government can't and what the market won't. And so we're always going to be that additional lifeline and minimum support for communities. But I think I wouldn't be surprised if uh, unions, wage boards, um, prevailing wage, all that kind of stuff came up when we get to our wage meeting discussion, which I don't have my list in front of me, but I think that is the March meeting. Okay, um, so the, I think the last thing, this is turning out to be a really short agenda planning meeting, but um, I kind of want to, I guess, Amy, let me know if it's okay. I kind of want to take a little bit of time just to talk about the February meeting because we're not going to have, or how do we fit this in maybe is the better question. So at the December meeting, um, we were able to kind of show everybody the the uh, Excel spreadsheet with the results from the jam board and the questions we wanted to ask and get a little bit more feedback on what questions folks wanted there as we were creating the list that then went to the department. And because we have so many departments presenting, we're not going to have as much time for kind of general discussion at this meeting, but I still want to make sure that we're able to kind of re-review that list of the questions that came up in the jam board. Um, and so it feels like we either need to find time in this agenda to do it, um, or that's something that we discuss at the agenda planning meeting, but that would be this meeting because the February agenda planning meeting happens the week before and departments need, I think, I would think the entire month to know what questions they're needing to respond to for February. Go ahead, Marianne. Um, so it looks like you're maybe at two hours and 15 minutes right now. So that leaves us time for a break. And then maybe the other half hour is discussion. Is that what the timing looks like? 
maybe because we have one less department. Because I thought maybe when Amy and I were doing this math, um, we had we had like almost exactly the uh, amount of time we needed. Right, and, and I, say, I do want to talk about the February meeting today more. It's the, oh, sorry, Amy, I was just responding to the chat. I do want to talk no, about the February meeting today. I just don't know if we're allowed to. <laughs> Um, I, I think we are allowed to, um, and I think it's important, Mercedes, because I have heard from several agencies that the ask that we had for them for this month was really hard for them, um, not only because of the holidays, but it's really difficult for agencies to pull the types of information that we're asking for, and so um, they need more time to prepare. And the, the other caveat I'll add in there is that we're um, headed up into legislative session. And so a lot of these agencies resources are the same people who are sitting on this task force that also help with legislative session. And so um, agencies are already feeling a little bit of angst that it's going to be difficult to meet the needs here and um, the expectations of the task force. So anything we can do to um, get in front of that and give them ample notice, even if we could look out, you know, a few months, if, if this group can, you know, cultivate that list and get it prepared, I think agencies would be very appreciative of that. So let's go ahead um, and pull up our Excel spreadsheet. What we're looking at this is that the other one. Amy, do you have notes from our last meeting about the order we were going in? I do. Give me just one moment. I'll pull that up. I'd pull up the right tab. Um, for February, we have uniform application procedures. Okay. So I am going to share my screen and I'm going to pull up our jam board. Well, I'm actually going to pull up the Excel spreadsheet if it's the results of the jam board. And then we'll look at that together. So I can't see you all. So if somebody could let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. All right. So the questions that we have so far under our uniform application procedures, and we want to try to do kind of the same things we did before, which is if we can consolidate some of these under themes. Um, and just check for anything missing. So we've got, uh, can we have a pre-approval process that's shared across agencies? Um, and so I think this question might be more, if I'm going to jump back to the Jamboard, when that question came up, we've got all these little red stickies, um, you know, that are kind of telling us 
they don't have a shared system to store these things. Um, you know, it's, it's a communication issue between program and procurement. So we actually had, I think, quite a lot of uh, response from departments on these kind of questions. So this one might be more of a thing of like, what are the challenges as opposed to like the can we? Um, it's going to be the same thing. Um, and because I can't see you, if you have like something to add or a question, just go ahead and unmute and jump in. Um, why is procurement separate from grant management when awarded? Sometimes when communicating with space, it translates to other space. So I think this is maybe directly to that question about communication between procurement and the grant on oversight. Mercedes, I think this also, this is Debbie, I think this also has a little bit to do with how authorities are distributed in the agencies. And so um, it, I'm not saying it has to be the way it is, but it might take sort of pushing on the agencies a little bit to think about, should we be consolidating authorities or, you know, lining up authorities for these like functions, I guess. Mm -hmm. So maybe do you think that's related to this question here or like kind of what are the regulatory changes needed to be put in place to create consistent procedures? Is this, do we need to know who, who has jurisdiction to make decisions? I think so. Um, however, I also think that in a lot of ways, how can I say this? In terms of the procurements, that's pretty prescriptive in our laws and in our rules. In grants, it is not. So we have a lot more um, ability to make some policy changes without a lot of um, uh, sort of legislative process or, you know, things that are, the path there is easier than when you have to go after a legislative change. So, um, I don't even know that in some cases it's regulatory. Maybe we could say regulatory slash process, policy, not process, but policy, regulatory and policy changes. And it also seems like um, the the agencies, uh, different programs are, are the state different programs are kind of siloed. And so yes, uh, they each have a different different way to do it mm -hmm. which further complicates things as opposed to having something that's more streamlined that would apply correct and i think would we make, could create that through either statewide policy or through administrative rule I think that's perfect. Okay. And we have funding that renews each biennium. Why is the SOW developed every time? Does it work? Sorry. I didn't mean to move it so fast and give anybody. <laughs> from my from my chair, that's a great question. I don't know why people would be doing that. <laughs> that's just extra work. But I think that again, it kind of relates back to what Mercedes or what Marianne was just saying that um, if we had sort of a, a even a skeleton of this is the standard process that you follow and who does what. Um, I think some of these one-off things could get resolved. 
I know in Lane County, we actually, they do an RFP and then you, if you win that RFP request for um, proposal, then, sorry. Um, then it can renew several times. It can re re renew three or four times. The d the thing with that, um, th it, that it renews everybody, and what you really need to do is build in some kind of three or four or five percent increase each biennium. Otherwise, you're stuck at that same rate for three or four years. Even if you're um, even if your wages go up. So that probably relates to a different multi-year contract question somewhere. Yeah, because there's another question here that's kind of like, why do nonprofits get a contract and then have to do another budget. I, I don't know if that's exactly the same as kind of this workflow question. Um, for like new funding versus renewal. And I think cause this is where um, yeah, how I mean I guess I'm wondering how detailed do we need this answer to be per department? Because I think some of this is also how much discretion does the department have? Maybe this is more of a question of like, the department's put in the request for ongoing funds, right? They're like, we want to renew this for the next biennium. We need X number of dollars to do that. And there's some sort of calculation that they are doing for what it costs to continue doing that. That may be the same or different than what the contractor actually needs to do it for another biennium. So can we ask each agency to say if they do multi-year contracts? So that should be a question that gets answered in this next meeting. Right. Yep, it's definitely a question in, in our payment models list. Um, so hopefully we'll already know the answer to that question. So I think we should we can try to maybe narrow this down a little bit more because this is about uniform application. So kind of jumping back up to the top, what are the yeah. challenges um, to having pre-approval process that is shared. That's what we want to know. Why can't you have a shared pre-approval process that is a shared across agencies? Ladies, can I ask a quick question on this one? Are, are we envisioning each agency to present the answers to this individually? Because as I'm reading through this one, and since we're really kind of narrowly focused on uniform application, <clears throat> it makes more sense to me to have the agency reps get together and prepare this presentation as a group. I'm wondering that too, and I think part of it is kind of going back over here and seeing, you know, each agency our agencies had different and different like things that they added here. So like each project has specific insurance requirements. That may be true for SF, which I don't know who that is now. Um, that may not be true of, of another department, right? OIA is saying here that they have issues between communication between procurement and program. Is that something that's just an OIA problem or is that something that is a multi-agency problem? I'm assuming the mm -hmm. procurement arm of the department and the program arm of the department are still under OYA. So there's so the disconnect is internal to the department and mm -hmm. as well as there isn't a function for ex that kind of external engagement, unless I'm understanding that wrong. 
No, and then we I have don't. Here who's saying that they do share information. Mm -hmm. So I like but the I, idea of a shared yeah. presentation, but I just I wonder if there's enough now. If if there, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I guess I, what we're asking for is can all you agencies, myself included, work together and having, we're not asking for each agency to come up with a uniform application, right? We're asking the agencies to, to work together and as state agencies have a uniform application. And, yeah, and this would be collaboration. If that's the end goal, then now would be a good time for them to talk to each other to figure out how far, you know, to give the task force feedback on whether that's going to be feasible or not. So maybe we do this in January and then in March or April, we have a whole list of um, like a spreadsheet with different columns for each, you know, youth authority or uh, organ emergency or whatever. And then we ask specific questions. Is this the same for you do you need a separate insurance policy why and then we have them come back as a group to say why is one so different than the other yeah so i like debbie i like to you kind of taking us back to what uniform application process is real big so i think one it would be phenomenal if the state had a single pre-approval process for any nonprofit they would want to work with. We don't even think within departments they have a single application process. I don't even think within divisions right. of departments they have a single application process. Correct. It seems to be every initiative has a different application process. And so, so me, I mean, part of me wants to know why in one agency, they can't have one process, let alone why can't all the agencies have shared process? I think that's where I'm struggling is I, I'm not even sure a single department is capable. So I would suspect that they would just come back and say, we can't do it. And I want to avoid the uh, thought terminating responses. Got it. And perhaps I was narrowing this down too much to a uniform application form not the entire application process so maybe i was thinking of a, a much more narrow slice of this bigger tab that we're looking at so well i'd love to hear from some other folks as well like kind of like seeing the questions that were populated here and um, amy i think this was the green post-it that you couldn't see so i copied this one in here um which i Again, like if state agencies aren't doing this one, that one's using for me a lot. Um, and then looking at the other information. Oh, okay. So maybe one of the things here is actually getting a little, getting some information on when the different agencies have to come to DOJ or when staff or DOJ are reviewing work that other agencies are doing. Maybe this is a good opportunity for us to see some of that workflow there. We just talked about how we wanted to know where, because I think one of the challenges right to a uniform application would be who puts it out, who reviews it, What does the pre-application elect? So yeah, I think we're just trying to get to a point where it, we don't have a different application process every time there's a new dollar that the state wants to spend. But how do we have just something more consistent? from other people are we looking to just try to figure out a pre-approval are we trying to look at a uniform application portal are we looking for uniformity within agencies across agencies like your other folks stopped
So if you're asking in line six, what are the limitations of information sharing across agencies? Do we ask that of the state? Do we ask that of the agencies? What hard so walls the are there? So the way we set the expectation is that each department would get an opportunity to respond to the questions that the task force has posed on each one of these items. So that's how we set up this first presentation. So this next presentation would be assumed to follow the same pattern. So we would want to structure these questions in a way that the departments could respond. I don't think there's anything wrong with departments wanting to present together. Um, but if, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if the challenges are imposed on agencies or developed because of agency specific policies, right? Is it OYA who's decided that their program and procurement staff don't talk to each other? Or was that someone else's decision? And I don't, I don't know how to ask that question to get to the answer because I don't know the underlying structures, right? Debbie, do you know any reasons or um, history as to why agencies couldn't share information between them? Information like um, uh, well, proof of insurance and those sorts of things? No, um, other than um, sometimes the insurance requirements vary. And so what is submitted to one agency may not transfer coverage for coverage to the next agency need. Um, but assuming that the requirements were all the same, there wouldn't be any reason we couldn't share those aside from we don't have an enterprise-wide like document repository. We don't have an IT solution that is accessible to all agencies that would hold that information. And who sets the minimum requirement? Um, it has to do with what the work of the, there's like an analysis that's done. It has to do with what, what the risk is, what the work is that's being done. Um, and that that's mostly what it is. There's a toolkit that we have. And is that by department or by funding source? Or like, is there, is the analysis done by a single body for each agency or funding source? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have most recently developed, um, it's sort of like a, a Excel, a smart Excel sheet where it asks a bunch of questions about the body of work and you rate, you know, like, oh, that's likely not to happen. Oh, yes, that is likely to happen. Uh, will the per, will the contractor or the grantee be using an, a via, an automotive, a automobile in the course of the work? Like it has a bunch of questions and kind of depending on how you answer those questions, it spits out a recommended series of insurance. And then from there, you still have um, uh, discretion on uh, how much risk the agency is willing to take. Um, if you want to lower the limits, then if something happens, that'll come out of your agency budget because there wouldn't have been enough insurance. And, you know, so there's still discretion there, but there is a common toolkit that all agencies are supposed to be using. And who created that? Uh, DAS Risk Management. Okay. And if an agency actually has a question or something that's unusual, then DASC Risk Management is the group that consults with them and helps them land on um, the appropriate levels. And I agree with Felicita who said, this is a very common barrier that we hear about is the cost of the insurance that the state requires. So I think we'd be happy to understand that more. We actually had a situation with uh, a Lane County contract 
that was asking us for more insurance and our insurance agency, because we were doing more and more homeless services, social services, that kind of thing, they were actually uh, not knowing whether they wanted to continue insuring us. And so I think insurance, when we actually went back to Lane County and said, would the would the county be willing to to spend X number of dollars to buy a million dollar policy and then we would have insurance in addition to that, but that would be the ground floor for the insurance so that a small agency who couldn't afford a million dollar policy would actually be covered. So some kind of sharing of the um, insurance cost and risk between the procurement and the program delivery. I believe that our risk management department did quite a bit of work on something similar to what you're describing, Marianne. Um, and so they would probably be able to come and uh, I see that um, Felicita is suggesting maybe they make a presentation. And if we choose to have them come, this would be a topic. We should ask them to present, like, what were their findings on this? on this shared model, what's doable, what's not doable, if it's not doable, why? Um, and I think that they they wouldn't have to do a lot of work to be able to prepare for that. Who is that? The DAS Risk Management Group. So kind of like just reorganizing some of the questions. <laughs> so I think part of it is what we want to hear from each agency is probably their workflow. What do they what are they doing from start to finish, from developing to implementing a grant? I don't know if I want to say agreement because that's almost like the end of the phase. Grant process. And then we also want to know roles and responsibilities. What must the agency have reviewed by DAS or and or DOJ? What is under the agency's discretion? And then the other questions then become what are the challenges to a pre-approval pre process and what are the challenges going to be Okay, so part of it is what can they share kind of within their own department and then what what are the challenges to being able to share information with different departments. Then we have gas risk management who has their own presentation on um, what was this one insurance. Um, do we talk about like shared database system or is that something that's separate? I think we were mostly asking about insurance because they were saying earlier that that must, might be an issue that made different agencies or different departments different was what level of insurance and the sharing of that information would be different, had to be different because of that. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's anything else that the DAS risk management presentation would speak to or if it would just be insurance. Debbie, what else does uh, risk management have jurisdiction over? 
on stuff that isn't really um they manage our self-insurance fund um and then they also um work on all you know all of the statewide lawsuits when when the state gets sued for a variety of things they're the ones that are managing all those lawsuits so that's that body the biggest portion of their work um really isn't applicable to our task force they also do all the workers comps claims and work with safe and sort of that side of state risk management so then agency uh nonprofit agency insurance uh requirements is the big thing that we want to ask them about yes I, I, Yes, I would say yes, and just sort of a primer on um, how the state evaluates and decides what levels are important and how much discretion an agency has. I think, you know, I know the answers to a lot of those questions, but I don't think our task force does. And um, perhaps some of our, um, perhaps some of our state agency partners may not, you know, exactly know how much discretion they have in this area. Felicita, it looks like. Can, can you hear me? Yes, apologies, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in a Starbucks um, so that I'm not late for my three o'clock across the street. Um, I'm trying to uh, come up with a thoughtful question um, that makes sense because the overarching goal of this is to look at all these pieces and how it ties to wages. So I just want to make sure that in this presentation around uniform applications that we're asking a thoughtful question about where does wages play into the application process? Like, do people have to share what their wages are or agree to certain wages? Like, that's what's kind of on my mind in this loud coffee shop. I don't have a fully formed thought, but I just I wanted to say that. And thank you, Mercedes. You're amazing at organizing all these thoughts. Thank you. Um, as far as the wage question, I think that's, yeah, I'm not sure. Because I know in some instances, and this is again, this goes to the inconsistency though, right? Because like some applications you submit, you'll actually put, you know, for FTE, X amount per FTE, X amount for fringe and benefits. And then other times, um, you don't, you're not asked for that level of detail. And then sometimes when you're asked for that level of detail, it's amended for you. Like you said you wanted four FTEs, we're only going to pay for three. Other times it's like, you can still have four FTEs, but we're only going to pay X amount of dollars, which is, you know, 25% less than what you asked for. And that's the part that I think I don't quite understand is why some agencies will approve the budget and why other agencies will like rip apart your budget and what are the underlying like reasons for why they'll do different things with different buckets of money so for st vincent de paul we have federal state city county all of those different contracts and depending on the funding source it feels like it's based on funding source. Some of them have matches, some of them don't. And some of them you can push back and say, well, we can, this is our minimum budget that we could do this program for. And uh, if, if we don't, you know, and usually they give you a dollar amount in the RFP of how much, and then you decide, can I do it in that amount of time? And then if the RFP does not get any valid responses, then they come to you with a letter of intent and say, OK, so what could you do for this amount? Could you do two shifts a day instead of three? Could you do half the number of people? All of those kinds of questions. 
Right. And what I want to know is why do they do that? I know that they do that. <laughs> want to know why. So maybe a question about funding sources. What kind of funding sources can your department use? And what limitations are there on each one? Because it's all a negotiation of how much you're going to pay for the used car, right? In my opinion, it often doesn't feel like a negotiation. It just, it feels like this is how much money we have. This is the outcome we need. Can you do it or not do it? And if you can't do it, they're like, are you sure? We really need you to do it. I hear you. What, okay, don't so you I'm love gonna, people um, the way we do? Um, so I'm going to come back down here. So I think what we're looking at so far um, is kind of this restructured set of questions, which is really trying to understand the agency workflow on their, how they develop an application process. And implementing a grant, a grant. So we want to know from beginning to end, what are you doing? To put this together. We want to know who has uh, authority over what, what things have to go through DAS or DOJ, and what things does the agency have discretion over. For each agency, what is your challenge to having a pre-approval process? And maybe we should even just ask, period, right? Why can't your, why can't there just be one Every time there's a grant that do, like ODE does a grant, they use the same portal that asks you the same set of questions. And if you're pre-approved for that, then we'll get into the details later. But like, why don't we have anything that's the same? Why, is, why does every time you put out something, it's different? And then in addition to that, we wanna know Because I think part of this is like, if, when we make a recommendation, are we making a recommendation that each agency should have a single process, pre-approval process, or the entire state should? And part of that, I think, is understanding what the challenges are. And then what are their challenges with sharing information between programs within the department and among different departments? Um, and then we want to make sure that when they're explaining these challenges, they're differentiating between things that are their own administrative rule and things that would need legislative changes. And then we'd also have a presentation from DAS on the insurance requirements. So I'm going to want to, we have to close because now it is 3 o'clock, but I have to stop sharing <laughs> my screen. Back to the big group. Big group team, I stop sharing. <laughs> um, so I think that's a good place to start. Amy, what I would suggest is sharing, um, sharing what we have so far in that um, bottom section um, where I rewrote the questions. We'll use that as I think a double check at the January meeting. Like this is what we're going to ask the agencies to prepare for the February meeting. And we're also going to ask DAS to do a presentation on their insurance practices and have that be um, our last kind of round of checks. So anyone who didn't come to this meeting will be able to see the questions we've put on for February for the uniform application and make any last minute additions or changes. But at least the departments would get like a sneak peek at what the questions are going to be so we can, so they know that at a minimum it's going to be that we may have a little bit more nuance for seeing there. January presentation and sharing those with the group. So does that sound good to folks? Sounds good to me. No yep, sounds That's great. awesome. Okay. So we'll call that good for today. Thank you all for your time and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's wonderful working with you all. <laughs>